Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, on this very illustrious webinar. I'm really excited for you to get to um, hear from all the different lenders that we have joining us today. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves in a moment. Um, but first, a little grounding. Um, I can start by saying I'm Esteban Kelly and I'm the Executive Director for the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. We have this wonderful platform that allows those of you um, who are able to, to, to participate by either chatting questions um, in the little chat bubble window box um, or to raise your hand if you have a question and then we can unmute you and, and call on you when we get to that um, part. I'm supported here by Mo Mankling, who's our communications director, kind of driving the audiovisual components. So thank you, Mo. Um, and uh, we will be hearing from Deborah Hawkins from the Cooperative Fund of New England, from Mark Fick from Shared Capital Cooperative, uh, from Karen Haskins from the Working World, and also from Jesse Mishka from um, well, really from Dawn, which is a Democracy at Work network, um, as, a, as a Dawn peer technical assistance provider. But Jesse's home workplace is Equal Exchange, and she's gonna be walking us through our partnership with Kiva um, to explain how Kiva, Zip, and, and that loan program works. So if you have any, um, any questions or problems with any of the AV stuff, you can feel free to chat it silently, and uh, Mo will, uh, help you out. And otherwise, I, I would ask that people mute yourselves um, until we get to until we get to you or if we're going to call on you. And if there are any other questions um, at this point, you can just pop them in the chat because we're going to get rolling right away. This is going to be recorded. So I'm making sure you all know that. Um, and yeah, those are the basics. So in terms of framing, we were really interested in creating a space for members, co-op developers, um, technical assistance providers, supporters, conversions, all kinds of people who are involved in our membership to hear about some of the um, sort of primary methods for accessing capital and loans throughout the process of cooperative development or expansion, um, including for conversions. So we are really close with a lot of the different CDFIs that we've invited to join us on this call. Some of them we have direct partnerships um, and we've heard a lot of questions over the years and, and even in recent months about, um, about what it's like to get access to, um, to loans and financing for the different kinds of operations and different stages that you might be at in business development um, or even in, in exploring the feasibility. So everyone's gonna have a chance to walk through their particular financial products and, and how they operate. Um, and then we'll open up for some um, panel questions. So there'll be an opportunity to hear from everyone for about seven minutes or so. Um, then we'll do a couple questions from, from us here at the Federation and we'll open it up for Q and A and um, some next steps. Hopefully that sounds good. We're gonna start with Deborah first from the Cooperative Fund of New England. And uh, we do have slides for everyone that we're clicking through so you can follow along there. If you're only joining us by phone, you'll be able to access the recording later so that you can see the visuals because they're really, really helpful for understanding all this number stuff. And without further ado, go ahead, Deborah. Greetings, everyone. It's great to be here. I've been involved in the cooperative movement as a volunteer and educator for over 30 years and have several decades of experience in accounting. I'm relatively new to the Co-op Fund of New England, having started at the end of January. I was introduced to cooperatives in 1987 by watching the Mondragon experiment for a class assignment. I was so moved and inspired that the cooperative movement has been my passion ever since, and I am beyond delighted to be able to do this work. Slide two. CFNE makes loans to cooperatives and community nonprofits in New England and Eastern Upstate New York. We began as a lender to food co-ops in 1975, when it was very difficult for them to get funding. 
we started lending to worker co-ops in 1982, which means this is our 35th year funding worker cooperatives. In 2016, we loaned over $1.5 million to 11 worker co-ops. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're funded primarily by committed investors, are not having to depend exclusively on donations and grants, provides a stable and sustainable source of financing for cooperatives. A number of our former and current borrowers have also become investors. Our loans range from $1,000 to $1 million. If more is needed, we are the bridge to other lenders, often coming into the loan package first because we understand co-ops when traditional lenders often do not. We're very active conversion lenders and co-wrote a publication on financing conversions with the DAWI network and Project Equity. CFNE has financed the conversions of nine businesses with loans ranging from $7,000 to $750,000 and provided working capital or expansion funding to four others that did not need loans for their conversion. Hallmarks of our work with borrowers are flexibility and support. We are flexible concerning collateral, interest rates, terms, and responses to a borrower in difficulty. We provide both pending and existing borrowers with assistance and referrals and provide prompt responses to loan applications. We lend exclusively to cooperatives and small community nonprofits. Although both must be incorporated, co-ops can be incorporated either as cooperatives, LLCs, or S corporations. The only requirement is that their bylaws must provide for member ownership, democratic control, and equitable distribution of surplus. In 2016, 20% of our loans went to worker cooperatives the second largest segment in our loan portfolio. Our loans can be for just about anything, including working capital, inventory purchase, business expansion, plant and equipment, cash flow needs, property acquisition, bridge loans, and conversions. Slide three. We fund any kind of cooperative, food co-ops, worker co-ops, housing co-ops, producer co-ops, and hybrids at any stage of development. From time to time, we are able to make small unsecured loans to startups in the early stages of development. The diversity of our loan portfolio makes us a strong lender that can provide higher risk loans to startup co-ops. 91% of our borrowers are cooperatives. We are committed wholeheartedly to growing this as yet small, but growing and vital part of the economy. And slide four. I'm ready for questions. That's great. We are going to take questions um, from everybody when after everyone's gone through. So thank you so much, Deborah. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, so we'll move on to Mark next from Shared Capital Cooperative, where we, um, he's both going to talk about Shared Capital, but also the Worker Ownership Fund, which we co-launched several years ago um, as, the, as the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, but with um, investment capital from you guys, from a lot of our members who were in a place and a position to be able to invest in it. Um, and I know that we are looking to grow that fund again. So I'm going to kick it over to Mark to talk about all of that and that, that product that's happening. I know that membership is one of the requirements for getting access um, to that fund. So go ahead, Mark. Great. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, so yeah, so I'm Mark Fick. I am the director of lending with Shared Capital Cooperative. Um, I've been myself. I've been working with cooperatives of various sorts for about 25 years. Um, been working with Shared Capital in particular for about two years now. Um, shared Capital is is also a mission based lender. We are what's known as a community development financial institution, uh, similar to uh, Cooperative Fund of New England in that regard. Um, we are a cooperative ourselves, though, which makes us somewhat unique in the lending world. So we were designed uh, about 40 years ago by a group of cooperatives in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area that had trouble finding loans and, that they needed for equipment. And so they said, you know what, we as co-ops, we need our own fund. And so that was the origins of uh, Shared Capital Cooperative, historically, some of you may have known us as North Country Co-op Development Fund, but we changed our name about a year and a half ago. So we, as a cooperative, we are owned by our borrowers and our co-op investors. So one thing that is, again, that's unique about us is that in order to borrow from us, you actually need to become a member. And we work exclusively with cooperatives. So you must be a democratically run cooperative enterprise um, you can be incorporated in a variety of ways because those rules change from state to state. So what we really look at to prove that your co-op is your bylaws, your structure, how you operate to make sure that you are truly a democratic organization. If that's the case, then you're eligible to join us uh, with a small equity purchase and then become a borrower. So, and then on the other side of the equation, and I'll show you in a few slides where our money comes from, a lot of our money comes from co-ops. So right now, we have more than 200 members that are cooperative businesses of different kinds across 36 states around the United States. We work across the entire United States. Um, and uh, over the life of the organization, we've uh, provided, as you can see, about 840 loans, a little more than $46 million. And we will make loans of every, every anywhere from 5000 to a half a million dollars with our own money directly. <clears throat> but we also work frequently in conjunction with other funds like Co-op Fund of New England or the Working World or, or LEAF or other organizations. And when we work with other partners, we can do much larger transactions of a million or two million dollars on a regular basis as well. And so as you see from our mission there, really we were formed to create a fund that was owned and controlled by the cooperatives exclusively finance co-ops and so that's really front of mind as we do our business and how we do our businesses our purpose here is to create a democratic economy uh, to to deal with the ills uh, of our economy as it currently exists um, if you want to go to the next slide um, as Esteban mentioned we work uh, in partnership with the US Federation uh, on with something called the worker ownership loan fund this was uh, designed and uh, created about 10 years ago uh, in partnership with the US Federation. And it was really designed to target dollars that, were, uh, that we were managing for specifically for worker ownership, worker cooperatives. While we had previously provided a fair number of loans to worker co-ops, it helped to identify investors that said, hey, we want to specifically invest in worker co-ops because we work with producer, farmer co-ops, grocery store, food co-ops, housing co-ops, all different kinds. But there were investors that said, hey, we want our dollars to specifically go towards worker ownership and worker cooperatives. So working with the US Federation, we started that fund. And over the last 10 years, we've, we've targeted uh, 45 different loans totaling uh, three three and a half million dollars to worker cooperatives around the country and so as Esteban said we're looking to grow that fund and so investors that want to invest and target that we can work with them to put their money into the worker ownership loan fund we can talk more about that later if people have questions as well um, next slide please um, this is just to give you a sense of kind of where our money comes from um, so again, because we are a co-op of co-ops and we want to keep our money in the co-op economy, as you can see, I guess a piece of it got cut off there, but uh, right now, as of our last annual report, uh, about 47% of our dollars in our loan pool come from cooperatives. 
And so that's usually a good sign, co-ops investing in co-ops there. But you can see that about half of the rest of our fund comes from a variety of sources. Some of them social impact motivated investors, individuals who want to put money into this fund, um, banks and foundations that want to do some good with their money as well. And we do apply to government resources and occasionally uh, receive some government investments uh, for the work that we do as well for related to job creation and affordable housing creation around the country. Um, next slide. The next two slides really are just to highlight kind of how we think about our work and tying it back to the cooperative principles that hopefully many of you are familiar with. And I think the two that really highlight how we think about our work and also as we come to our conversation later about how our borrowers think about our loan fund and the money that a co-op should think about and how that co-op relates to the money that it uses. Um, autonomy and independence and the, the principle six cooperation among cooperatives really what help to frame how we do our work. And it's important when we are underwriting loans and thinking about how we structure our debt that the co-op is ultimately in control of what happens with its money. And we work in partnership with a co-op as a, as a lender to make sure that the money fits what they need, that they, they are not, that they are in control of that relationship and that they have uh, a true understanding of their, uh, the worker owner's relationship to the debt that they're taking on and also helping them to think about other kinds of capital that comes into a, a, an enterprise and what those different kinds of capital, debt, equity, whatnot mean for that organization. And next slide. Um, the other one, of course, which uh, more most uh, distinctly defines who we are is this cooperation among cooperatives. So we essentially work, act as a, a principle six uh, uh, in, for the economy. So co-ops uh, who are profitable and do well over the years, they will invest their money into a fund like ours. We turn around and bring that st straight back into the co-op economy to continue to grow that. And we have many stories over the years of, of uh, small co-ops that have come to us for a little loan for a truck, and then they do well, and 15 years later, they're coming back and they have a half a million dollars to invest in the co-op economy. And so we're seeing that play out over the long haul, and it takes a while to get there, but it's, it's exciting to see that happen. Um, I think that might be my last slide for the for the presentation and I can leave it there until questions later. There's my contact information. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. So now we're moving on to the working world and Karen is going to walk us through um, how they function and looking at equity. Great. Thanks, Esteban. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, I am the Director of Finance and Operations for The Working World. We're a nonprofit uh, cooperative loan fund. We've been around for about 14 years, but our origins are in, in Latin America. So we started in Argentina, um, expanded into Nicaragua, and then about five years ago, I opened an office in, in New York City. Um, so that's, that's where we're at now. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, great. So I mentioned, uh, you know, we're still located in all, all, um, all three country, countries. Um, between those three offices, we've invested in over a thousand cooperative projects throughout the year um, and have about a 98% repayment rate in full um, looking at those, those three offices. Um, we have a strong focus on, on economic inclusion. Um, the focus in our lending um, has been, is to low-income people and communities of color. Um, we actually, 90% of our dollars out have been to people of color. Um, and this is always, you know, our mission is always focused on, on low-income people of color. Um, but now we also have um, joined CFNE and shared capital in um, getting our CDFI certification, so um, the Community Development Science Institution um, certification by the, by the U.S. Treasury, the U.S. government. And, and with that, it also, uh, that certification requires that you do the majority of your lending to, to low-income people. So in accordance with that, we're still, uh, still focused there. Go ahead to the next one. Um, so 
We focus on worker cooperatives primarily. Um, we have done a few loans to consumer co-ops, um, and we're doing starting to look into things, uh, community-owned solar projects. But again, um, more than 90% of our loans, um, probably high, closer to 95 or so, are, are to worker cooperatives. Um, and this kind of covers the the range of it. So we can do we can do startups. Um, startup loans, um, expansion loans to existing co-ops, lines of credit. Uh, it's usually for materials, um, but it can also it can also be for other sorts of working capital. And um, lastly, the the capital for buyouts for for conversions, um, which I know um, Mark has Mark got and uh, has also mentioned. Um, so kind of the gamut of of sorts of capital, but, um, but really focused on the worker, worker cooperatives. Go ahead and go to the next one. Um, so how we make loans. Um, so there are some unique aspects to our lending that I'll, I'll point out. Um, so we provide technical assistance, um, but it's done in a very relationship-based way. So, um, you know, I have here, we provide capital with technical partnerships, so what, what does that really mean? Um, so it is technical assistance, but it's done very much in partnership with the cooperative. Um, and so it's a plan that, a business plan and an investment plan that everyone agrees to, one that looks feasible, um, and then the co-op um, is, you know, tasked with executing on that plan, but with our, with our help along the way. So that might look like being on the ground, uh, visiting the co-op once a week if that's needed. Um, but for some more established cooperatives that might not be needed, it might be a monthly phone call or something. And then we also have um, our capital uh, is a profit-based risk in equity-like capital. So I know there's, there's a lot <laughs> to unpack in, in that line. Um, so when we say profit-based, um, basically we have a more patient capital that um, will wait and will take repayment on our loans through through profits. Um, and a lot of times our sort of capital, because of its of its patient nature, but also because of its how it looks a little bit like equity, is referred to as risk capital. Um, and so we'll, I'll talk, I think, in the next slide about how we how we handle that risk um, and the equity-like feature. So um, most of the capital that goes out is is a loan, um, but in, we're always you know we don't take a share in the cooperative. We we leave the control and the ownership to the workers. Um, but there is an opportunity for us as a loan fund to receive higher returns in the case of a successful project, um, and especially especially on some of the larger startups we do, with the, um, where we have a kind of patient grace period of for years at a time. And then we can also put in to our loan contracts, uh, again, for these larger projects, um, a clause that would allow us to step in, a protection where it would allow us to step in um, and make some changes if if we need to, but then again, always stepping out and leaving that control and ownership with the workers. So it looks a little bit like equity, but there really is no, there's no voting share. Um, it's just uh, a little bit on the, on the returns end of it, and then also how, how we might um, add a clause in that, that helps us do some kind of emergency management of a, of a cooperative. Um, I think I'm ready for the... Yeah. Sorry? So Oh, here it is. Oh, That's sorry. Right. Got it. There was an issue where we were for a second. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> all right, so we get we get it all at once. I, got, I think so the slide is um, not in exactly the order, but that we'll, we'll work with it. So um, how do we manage the risk? So I mentioned that, that our capital is a little, it can be referred to as risk capital. It's very patient. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we know the borrower, um, and it really is, integral to our our capital model, our lending model, that we have a deep and trusting relationship with the borrower. Um, and how do we do that? We create a partnership um, and a shared vision. 
And the second point down there at the bottom, we have some influence on the borrower. So um, again, if because we're working together on this investment plan, um, if along the way something just isn't working and they need the business, the co-op needs to do 180, we can we can um, jump in and help them figure that out. And that's where we, we say we have a little bit of influence on the borrower and which direction they might take their business. Um, and again, this is an agreed upon plan that every all parties are, are involved with. But um, again, creating that partnership and that shared vision is, is how we how we manage the risk on our and our co-op investments and that is the last slide um so i will leave it there oh look there's a summary slide <laughs> um so um so our capital uh, provision is holistic like i said it's a technical assistance linked in with with the capital and the lending um partnering uh with with the worker cooperatives, with the members, um, helps to create a bridge of inclusivity. So people who might not have the financial tools or literacy or um, to do it on their own, our partnership can help help bridge that. Um, and lastly, this is, you know, every organization specializes um, in what kind of lending they do, what kind of products they offer. And this is just, um, this is just one way and this is the way that uh, we, we lend out the working world. Now I think that's it. <laughs> great. Um, we're doing great with time as well. And next is Jesse, who's going to explain how our trusteeship and, and um, relationship with Kiva works for very, very, very small, but not quite micro loans. Go ahead, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'm. My full-time job is at Equal Exchange, but I'm a certified Dawn peer advisor. And I went, a few years back, we did a pilot, um, Dawn, and that was when uh, Melissa was still at the US Federation, a pilot with Kiva. I believe they approached the Federation. Um, One moment, Jesse, do you mind bending your mic right into your mouth? No, I, I don't mind. Yeah. That was a preventive measure. All right. That Say that last sentence again. Yeah. I've been accused of being a heavy breather on conference calls, so I always put it very far. <laughs> <laughs> so sensitive to that. Um, this, is a, this was a pilot project where I think Kiva approached the Federation in t around 2012, actually. And so I love this presentation overall because each of these lenders is like they're so different like what <laughs> each of these ways of getting money and Kiva will be definitely in contrast it's not patient um, but it's also not conventional so um, we'll go through what's what is Kiva hopefully some of you have heard of it actually outside of this context um, what's the process what kind of loans can you get on Kiva the application process and then figuring out really this is the kind of thing it might be right for some groups and not at all right for another groups or maybe right at a certain point in time and not at a different point in time. So on the next slide, um, just to give you a visual, like Kiva looks very much like a, um, like a, a crowdfunding platform. In a way it is, it's just that you don't, they're all made as um, loans and donations. So an individual um, like me, like you, just can go on to Kiva, uh, don't put on some money like 30 bucks and then choose who to loan it to. And when it gets paid back, then it will, you can, you choose um, to loan it out to a different group. And it was actually when the pilot started, it was, there was Kiva for international loans and Kiva Zip for domestic loans. But since then they have combined, which is really good for the domestic loans because the Kiva had like, almost at that point it was like almost a million and the Kiva uh, lenders and the Kiva zip had many, many less than that. But now they're combined. And so I think their, their stat, this is later, is like they have like a one and a half million uh, lenders contributing. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, this is the overall process and it goes from uh, applying, which is done, I have a copy of the application, which for when folks want to know, like, what's on there? Um, and the, there's these three, actually, maybe I'll skip to the bottom. There's these three, three roles. There's the borrower, 
in this case would be like the co-op, uh, the trustee, in this case, the federation and, and the Don um, peer advisor, and then the actual lenders. So, and I guess I should have put one more role in there, which is Kiva itself. <laughs> so this review process is actually from the Kiva process, that's Kiva reviewing the loan, but because they want trustees to endorse borrowers, um, that's where the Federation and Dawn would be kind of between the first dot and the second dot, where we're working with uh, the borrower to prepare the application. Um, and there's a little bit of history there, actually, since when we first, when we did our pilot, which was with um, Teamworks, uh, we did a lot of vetting. Like, actually, it was so much, so much working with the borrower that um, Melissa at that point was like, this is a lot of work. With this much work, you could get a $50,000 loan instead of getting a $10,000 loan. Um, and since that time, Kiva actually they went away from the trustee model a little bit, but they've since returned to it because they found they really need trustees uh, basically to get valuable. They want the most social impact possible and they need the trustees to promote the Kiva loan program in order to get borrowers who really can have social impact. Um, but in any case, the overall process is after the loan application is reviewed, then a borrower would have to go through a private fundraising period and then a public one. So the public one is what you see, kind of that picture that I show with all of the little profiles and photos. The private fundraising period is what they do. It means you get to, to show that you, instead of having to like have great credit or submit any kind of credit score at all, you just have to demonstrate that you have a a base of a network that you can fundraise from. And I think it's for like two weeks, that's further down in the presentation. And it's not even a lot of money. It could be like, I, if they have a number, let's just say it's like two dozen loans of 30 bucks each, that's totally sufficient to demonstrate you have the capacity to fundraise further and that you have community support. So there's the private fundraising period and then there's the public where any kind of stranger could, could donate uh, or loan to you um, and you're fully funded. Uh, if you don't get fully funded, you don't get the loan and all the potential lenders get their money back or in this case kind of redeposited to their Kiva credits. Um, and, then you have, and then you have to start repaying. Um, and all this money is happening via PayPal, money flow. Okay, next slide. Let me see. Um, so here's the terms, kind of simple. There's 0% interest. I think this is one reason why Kiva needs trustees because most people say, show that and they say that can't be true. How can I get a loan for 0% interest? Um, and there's no fees. <laughs> um, but, it's, but it is true, they're a nonprofit and this is their reason for being. Uh, and typically the loans are basically in these increments depending on the amount and the project. Uh, let me see if there's anything. In Nope, that's it. I, the one thing I'm not positive about is the PayPal. I'm not sure if PayPal charges a fee, but definitely Kiva and the Federation cannot. So the next uh, slide is about the loans. Oh, back to the loan sizes. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is, I think these are, and it does say typically, right? So this is not hard. It seemed like when we had our last s and I had a call with um, the Kiva, one of the Kiva contacts, and it seems like they're actually very flexible, um, which is great considering that I would expect something that's an online platform to be much more regimented and kind of standardized. Um, but when you're working with a trustee, there's definitely a uh, contact with humans if you if, if we need it. So you have these smaller loans at a thousand dollars if you're more of a startup um, and then a medium-sized loan if you have kind of some demonstrated performance and then you can get the larger well larger in the context of what Kiva offers the six to ten thousand um, if you've been around and have and have some demonstrated business. And the strong I think the strong online presence is about how well you will be able to fundraise. And it doesn't only have to be online, like in the case of, of um, Teamworks, because they have clients where they're going into those client homes but for their work, they were actually able to live letters and fundraise that way, um, which totally worked. So um, the next slide is the timeline of overall, just how long, how long does it take to apply and get some money? Um, and these ranges are, 
obviously like it says how long it takes to fill out the application um, can range and then the private the review is is fairly quick turnaround as well um, but then the private fundraising has to be completed within 15 days and the public part has to be completed within 30 days um, so sometimes there's extra work in that public fundraising period to if you're not getting as much um, as many loans contributed as you want then you have to do more promotions um, and then a pretty quick turnaround on the dispersal and having your PayPal account ready will help and this is one thing that changed from when we did the pilot because when we did the pilot the individual the PayPal account had to be by an individual and so it's kind of a this was like the one sticking point where we like we really want this to be to the co-op because the co-op is an organization right so how can we don't want it to just be two individuals um, in this case the profiles or then it was featured in two different individuals but the stories were very much about the co-op now paypal does you can totally use an organization's paypal account and i saw pictures when i just looked at the website the other day of profiles of, of groups as well um, so the next slide is the application itself what's involved is really because we're talking online right the photo the story a description of the business and the purpose of the loan and then a little promo blurb um, Kiva is looking at so this is one thing I think that they still do which is kind of a disconnect with co-ops is they want the business finance information but they also want um, personal finance information and that so when we get to the is it right for you or not that might be one of the things that if your members uh, don't want to provide personal finance information um, then that would have to be either they might not accept that um, otherwise they're really looking like I said about the social impact and then using these kind of character and network factors to determine your likelihood of repayment as opposed to necessarily just your cash flow or something like that um, and that's also where the role of the Federation and Dawn come in because we so there's no penalty for the Federation or Dawn if if we put out loans if we endorse loans that that aren't paid back however the I shouldn't say there's no financial penalty the penalty would be if we do that and it happens enough like we won't be a trustee anymore and this kind of source of potential funding would wouldn't be available to us because we wouldn't be basically trusted as a trustee um, one so Kiva doesn't ask for any collateral at all no tax returns no formal credit score they don't ask for a business plan but when the Federation and Don did um, endorse a, a borrower we did ask for a, bar, a business plan because we felt like that's gonna one it is actively kind of training or development professional development for the co-op if they don't have one but also that's what we felt like we needed in order to determine whether or not we thought we should endorse um, the co-op so final or yeah almost second to last penultimate slide um, Kiva can be uh, a Kiva loan could be good for a co-op that has lots of connections socially either online or you know access lots of clients um, lots of supporters it is a I guess I didn't put this in, this wasn't in the details but the repayment begins right away like in a month after you get the money so you have to have enough existing income or a quick enough return on what you're going to do with the money to start paying right away um, you also this is something that wasn't I think is new since they started it, or since we did the other one they now report the the paybacks um, the payments to Equifax so if you need to build credit because you don't have credit uh, if you need to establish it this will do that um, assuming you pay it pay back and then if also it's almost like a, a source of last um, you know it's a last option if you can't qualify for money in another way this is might be one way that you can it's not a good it probably wouldn't be good for your group if you don't have many connections um, or you need a longer grace period um, it's also very it is just like it's almost like social media like if you don't want to share updates with your borrowers then it, it'll be a pain to you so I didn't this wasn't in the previous slides but one thing that happens is that people who loan money to you will 
might ask a question or even if they don't ask questions you should proactively like update them on what's going on with how you spent the money and usually it's it's just kind of light and, and can be fun but if that's not what you want to do it won't be fun for you <laughs> um, and then also if there's there's kind of this philosophical if you don't want to have to associate uh, apply it in the name of an individual and and we can't get around that at the kiva side then it wouldn't be a good match either um, and that's, I think on the next slide is just a link to, so they rely, like if a co-op were interested in this, they should actually go to the Kiva website through the Federation Dawn um, link. So then track, track it as, as ours. And then we would go through our process of trusteeship considering trustees. That's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. I was just saying, I'm so glad we're doing this webinar. <laughs> it's very, very helpful. Um, so thanks for demystifying all that stuff and, and introducing your various organizations and, and programs. Um, I, before we go to general Q&A, have just a couple questions teed up um, for you. And the first one, I, I actually am going to make each organization answer. Um, and that's about the the worker co-op ecosystem. So my question is what impact are each of your organizations having um, on the worker co-op eco ecosystem? I know that some of you are lending in specific areas. I know that some of you lend to other kinds of cooperatives or other small businesses, but how does this particular, your, the set of projects um, that you steward, how, how, do they, how are they having an impact? I know a lot of this has also been implied when you were talking about your missions and, and the, 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 the origin story of why you do the work you do. Um, but if you could just say a little more explicitly what, uh, something about the impact that you're having on the worker comp ecosystem. You can go in any order. Um, I, can, I can start out, uh, Mark, with shared capital. Um, I, I, and I touched on it a little bit in our description, I think. So, I mean, big picture, really what our, it's, it's in our mission is, as an organization is we, we are held here to build a democratic economy. And so part of that building a sort of a parallel democratic economy in the United States is about creating this loan fund, again, that is owned and controlled by the cooperative sector. And so the degree that the cooperative sector as a whole understands the importance of having its own money to do what it will with, I think is, is sort of a fundamental uh, element to our impact. And so while we do that across all co-op sectors, um, I think we, you know, been able to leverage money from other co-op sectors to bring them specifically to the worker co-op system. And then with things like the worker ownership loan fund there too, we can help target people's dollars into the sector that they want to approach. I think in other areas, um, it's about making connections sometimes between individual co-ops. So we have individual cooperative investors that get to know some of our borrowers through the relationships that we build. Um, and then I think in the process of what we do, uh, which is I think similar to some of the other lenders that you've heard from here, is uh, we, we're trying to create a space for financing that really understands what a worker co-op is specifically, why people pursue worker ownership, what's important about that, and then creating loan products and financial services and products that fit those needs and understand that situation. Um, the particulars of each individual co-op as well as connecting them with the experience from other co-op sectors. So there are things that we learn from the food grocery store co-op world, the housing co-op world, the agricultural co-op world that we can bring to the to the worker co-op space as well. Um, in a lot of ways, um, we can learn our lessons in other sectors and try to bring them and tailor them to the worker co-op world. Okay, who wants to jump in next? I'm happy to go next. This is Deborah. Um, because any ecosystem depends for it, health and sustainability on increasing diversity, we are continuing to emphasize um, helping a number of sectors 
in the economy, which are also, it's also part of our CDFI charter, um, by giving priority to co-ops serving economically disadvantaged communities. Uh, co-ops in which more than half of its members have low income. And co-ops that have experienced unusual or unavoidable economic adversity that is beyond their capacity to rectify on their own. Um, we've also renewed our commitment uh, as an organization, as a board, to work more actively for economic, social, and racial justice by helping to contribute to an inclusive and equitable co-op economy. Um, among these efforts are developing greater diversity on our board, on our staff, and among our borrowers. Uh, we are not um, as a, a nonprofit organization allowed to be politically active, but we can support the kind of inclusion our ecosystem and our whole economy needs by the co-ops we reach out to and fund and support. I can, I can probably be brief because if it, if it wasn't obvious from the the way I was talking about, we, we've actually only done one loan with Kiva. Um, and so I can't say what it, how it has changed it, but I think where the niche, where we see the niche um, is really with co-ops or co-op projects or startups that would otherwise be virtually unfundable. Um, that's can, probably where Kiva fits in. I know. Yeah. I know that we weren't involved as an underwriter or a trustee in it, but there have been some uh, startup projects, like the, the, was it in Alabama or no, uh, Arkansas. There was a food-based uh, worker co-op that used Kiva. Used Kiva. Yeah, um, and I know several people. So part of, it was almost the, the, the flip side that our ecosystem had an impact on, on Kiva, right? And mm. That project to be successful just because we were already well, yeah networked um yeah one other kind of one thing we would hope a hope a hope for outcome would be because kiva is has so many lenders it's very also could very much be like a marketing um just a way of getting worker co-ops in front of more people just not as like a concept awareness or a structure mm -hmm. awareness mm -hmm. yep. That's great. go ahead karen okay. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, I think some of these things came out in, um, in my presentation, but um, so the impact, um, some of the impacts we're trying to have on the, on the worker co-op ecosystem um, is, so one of those things is to provide um, an offer for, to offer that, this option of patient capital when that's the, um, the sort of capital that's needed and it makes the most sense for that worker cooperative, which um, I guess Jessica mentioned might not be right. So all these kinds of capital aren't right for every co-op, um, but in in this way, allowing for the time that it takes for startups to to grow um, without having the the burden of having um, debt payments when they're not quite at at solvency yet, um, and doing this in a way um, that is inclusive and including people that. Um, normally have been either excluded from um, these from normal banking or um, or from low income marginalized communities and um, as I mentioned before too something um, with that technical partnership um, so another another thing that we do when we so because of how that works we're really on the ground with the co-ops and so if there's a co-op who Ask for a loan and they're not in our area, not in New York City. Uh, we do have partners around the country that can take that role as a technical on the ground partner with the co-op. Um, and so, you know, if we were to do, um, it, uh, we, have, we have actually loans out in Baltimore um, and we have a group called BREAD, um, the Baltimore Roundtable for Economic Democracy, and they do um, they do the on the ground technical assistance with those co-ops um, and you know we're in um, uh, we've done joint joint lending for instance the shared capitalist um, the Renaissance community cooperative 
in Greensboro, North Carolina. So it's a way that we can um, can also share that sort of um, technical assistance. But I guess that's just another way of um, growing that possibility of lending for co-ops around the country is by using sort of on the ground on the ground technical support um, through partnerships that we have. Sure. Um, so my next, well, I guess my last question, this, this is kind of a two-parter. Um, how do you, how would you advise potential Coming from you, Deborah. Thanks. Um, yeah, how do you advise potential grantees to be loan ready? So if, if there are borrowers, whether they're worker co-ops or, or a democratic workplace, a conversion <coughs> project, what, what are the, the different steps or advice that you have for, for them to be loan ready? We get that question all the time. So I wanted to, to put that in there, but also couple it with this other question, which is what kind of support do you offer that, that assists potential grantees to be ready to apply? So it's kind of a two-parter question, and it doesn't matter to me how much you skew toward the first or the second part, um, but, but I, I'm curious to hear from each of you about um, loan readiness and um, loan support and assistance to, to be ready. Again, we can go with in any order. Someone else want to start this time? Go ahead. Okay, I'll go. It's Deborah. Um, well, straight on advice, work on your business plan. We don't require a formal business plan on our, org, on our uh, application, but the questions we ask presume many of the elements of a business plan. Um, one of the toughest but most informative and rewarding parts of, a, of the application is your financial projections. It's a bear, but it pays off for you because you learn a lot and it pays off for us because we know what we need to know about, about how you plan to move forward. Um, we really recommend if you want a loan from us to contact one of our loan officers on one of them. Um, a good six to four months ahead of time because we're in a position to support you through the process either uh, provide technical assistance ourselves or refer you to assistance for many of these elements and we really want to get to know you um, like working capital we're very much committed to a an equal and productive relationship with our borrowers um, so we like to stay in touch, answer questions, um, offer referrals for market research, which is not always an easy thing to get done in a reasonably affordable way, um, and especially helping you with refining and improving your loan package. When we get it and do the underwriting, we like to have confidence that it's everything it needs to be and that it will likely be approved um, because that's what we're about and we don't want to keep sending it back. Um, if your funding needs exceed uh, our loan limit, then we can begin early connecting with other lenders to create a package that will meet your needs. Um, and we can also, ref again, refer you. There's a lot of resources, for instance, with the Small Business Administration for some of these elements that help you put together a strong loan package. I want to say that we do not require credit scores or tax returns, and we also can delay principal payments um, for as long as necessary, uh, sometimes creating a quasi-loan payment plan which we're prepared then to renegotiate and refinance as the loan uh, comes to an end. So um, those things are, are also not terribly standard, but ways in which we can support, especially startups who don't have the cash flow to begin with to be making loan payments right away. Sure. That's great. Thanks so much, Deborah. Yeah. Okay, who's up next? Karen? I can go next, sure. All right, yeah. Um, so we do have, you know, we, ha we get um, inquiries and in we do have an intake form that um, we can send out to co-ops that 
are sort of at a place where they have their um, financial plan in order. As Deborah mentioned, they have their projections, which is always a, a big hurdle. Um, if they have all these things in place and they really know what they need and, um, and uh, can share that with us, there, there's an intake form that they can, that they can fill out. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the lowest touch sort of lending that we do. Um, it's not the, it's not you, it's not the typical lending. Um, so it is a lot of times the co-ops will come to us and um, they do need help with their projections or, you know, they don't exactly know what they, they need to grow their business. Um, and that's, uh, we'll, we'll partner with them to, to come up with a plan that makes sense uh, for them. Um, and a plan that's going to pay itself back. So, again, we can be very involved with that as needed, um, as long as uh, through our intake process that project has passed certain impact metrics on our end. So, making sure that we're we're being inclusive, working with the communities that we um, are have identified as community as communities that are um, low income, people of color, like I've mentioned. Um, and then looking at ecological sustainability as well as um, democratic power. So what, what sort of um, governance structures do they have? Um, again, by looking at bylaws or if they're in the process of, of completing those, what, what is their plan to, um, to have a, a democratic structure in their, in their business? Um, and then we'll look at that with our capacity. So, um, we can be on the ground and we can be helping people with anything really um, that they, they might need or partnering with people who might have that expertise. Um, but it's always weighed again against our capacity. So um, we look at projects that are New York City based um, for our office, for our, for our loan officers. Um, but we can really, we can really uh, guide the co-op through that process. Great. Um, next, Mark? I can go next, sure. Okay. Um, I th for us, I think a lot of it is so people come to us, uh, fundamentally it's about to get loan ready is knowing this. You know, do you know, do you really understand the business you have or you're proposing? Do you know your place in the market in which you operate? Do you know who your customers are and why they should choose your business over some other business? So I think it's a lot of those fundamental things that are going to be true among any small business that's looking for financing from anyone. Um, I think a, a second layer is is really understanding what kind of money you need. Um, debt is a little different from equity, is a little different from other kinds of investment, which is different from member equity. And, and so all of these dollars can be used in slightly different ways and they have different parameters and requirements on you. So understanding what kind of money you need for your situation, I think, is a good uh, loan readiness uh, concept to grapple. I think the next thing is... Um, does uh, you know people are passionate one second about mark on that do you do you play a role in helping people understand those different um thing, you know debt and equity and patient capital and operating capital and all this okay yeah so we do a lot of a lot of uh kind of hand holding and understand general consultation early on in in that you know, we do a lot of it informally based on kind of where people are and where they want to get to. And we also do more formal workshops like at the Eastern Conference and, and other conferences around the country as they happen. So uh, both in informal and formal ways, we can help people think through that, what kinds of money they need and fitting it to, to what's available. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, people are very passionate when they're starting their business or expanding their business. And for us, sometimes it's about understanding this balance between the ideals and the vision of the business, but then uh, like uh, placing a template of, of realistic expectations over that. And so, and the way we kind of think about that is what's your plan B and what's your plan C? So things very rarely happen the way we want them to. And so if they aren't going to happen that way, how do we pay off this investment or this debt if things don't happen during plan A? And what does that look like? So. I'm sure sometimes from the borrowers or the applicants perspective, it feels like we're throwing a lot of cold water on the, their passion. Um, but that's part of our job is to see, okay, you've got the right vision. You're, you've got the energy. 
let's make sure we're, we're focusing that in the right ways and what that looks like. Um, and then there too, so we can, we provide a lot of feedback along the way. We do get a lot of calls where people are just at this, we have a crazy idea stage and that's great. We're happy to have those conversations. Think about, okay, what are the next couple of things you should work on to start to build this into a plan? And we also get inquiries from people that have most everything figured out already and then we'll take them at that stage. So, you know, that kind of informal handholding, the overall kind of feedback on business planning, financials, projections, things like that. And then as a couple of other people mentioned, we do a lot of referrals. So we don't have a formal, uh, you know, extensive TA program. So we'll refer people to other TA providers, uh, group folks from Dowie, you know, if you're in the New York area, work at the working world, other folks like that, other local TA providers as best we can, or other lenders. If we can't quite provide what you need, uh, then we want to make sure you can get what you need. And so we'll, you know, based on the, the number of the different sources you've got here, you've got a lot of different kinds of money you can tap. Okay, so now, Jesse, I know that you've already um, explained this bit about the loan readiness. Mm. But I'm wondering, in terms of the, um, the support and assistance, if, if now is a good time for you to just give us like 60 seconds on Dawn? Um, and just oh. explaining to people what, yeah. <laughs> what that here technical assistance network kind of does and, and offers and yeah. Um, yeah, sure. And actually, so, I mean, specific to the, um, to the loans for with Kiva. So right now, like for example, when we did the pilot, I, that was my volunteer time. And if we were to do a couple more, which I want to, and I would train another um, peer advisor as well, um, we probably would also have to do that as volunteers because there is no, um, yeah, we can't charge, like in terms of Kiva clients, we can't charge them. Um, and right now there's no kind of established um, where that would come from in terms of paying for our time. However, that's why I want to do it because I want to be able for us to show like a demonstrated need um, that, that, that whether in terms of the grants that should be covered. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot. I'll get to the Dawn piece, but just to wrap up the Kiva side, one thing that's also different about Kiva is that they now have, um, I think it's like a dozen trained coaches who are funded through their own um, grants. And that's just about really coaching folks through how, through the loan process or through the, um, even after they're approved, like how to get it out to enough uh, folks in their network so that they do get funded. Um, so even though we might not have time at a particular moment to, to spend on that, we can direct them to, to a specific individual who would at Kiva who would help a co-op um, promote their co co loan and get it funded. Um, in terms of John, so what you, I think Mark just mentioned Dowie and Dawn was kind of like, Dawn is a network of people who either do work now at a worker co-op um, like I do or who have uh, or did when they became members. And so we are, we go through a one year training process um, to, on how to be peer advisors. And we specifically focus on the peer aspect of it because it is like being a consultant, but we're advising from this unique seat of like we are or recently have been um, where you, the client, are right now. Um, and so that's right now, Dawn is basically a volunteer run organization, but we do get paid for projects often depending um, either by the client or through like rural funding or some of the other grants that are out there that are coming mostly through um, through the Democracy at Work Institute. Um, so that's really, I don't know if is. I mean, in terms of how Dawn works, there is also an intake, there's an online intake form and definitely co-ops, either existing or startup or interested individuals, they write into that intake form. And then um, our coordinator, who's also on the listening in here, Allison, she um, basically determines whether she's going to talk to them or one of the other uh, peer advisors who's on intake for that month is going to talk to them and find out whether we send them to a, a DAWI webinar, startup webinar, if that's where they're at, or if they're ready to talk to a lender that's like one of the other panelists, um, or if they need a, need a more in-depth analysis of what's going on and then figure out if they actually um, will, would want technical assistance in a project format. Is that kind of what you were thinking, Esther? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and we already have a couple questions um, queued up here. So I will start blasting through them. And if you have more, please do chat them in. Um, so here's a question from 
from she, which is that uh, Cooperative Fund of New England says that, the, that they only serve co-ops in New England and the Northeastern Seaboard. And I see that Kiva serves borrowers in California. Does shared capital in the working world also? So I guess it's a question about where, what are your areas that you lend in? I, it, it is true that CFNE um, is in New England as well as New York, um, but the, re the rest of you can speak to where you lend. Yeah. I know the answer. Kiva, I think, is anywhere in the world, so that's right. my answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, and the working world is in certain parts of the world. <laughs> Yeah, uh, shared capital, we work all across the country, but we typically, if you're in New England, we're going to refer you to CFNE first to make sure you, you use them first. Right. Great. Um, and the next question is for Karen. Uh, oh, wait, did your question come up, come through, Daniel, or did you want to just ask it? I can unmute you. You ready for that? He's muted. Okay. Yes. Go yes. ahead. Yes. Yes, I'm ready for that. Uh, <laughs> my question was for uh, Mark and Karen. Um, Karen, because the working world works across national borders, was there um, a discussion around how to incorporate as a tax exempt organization, or did you go the CDFI route? at the shared capital cooperative did and then for both of you um, because your tax exempt donations that are focusing on cooperatives and there's so many ways to define a cooperative um, what did you find the IRS required for you to use as parameters thanks Dana go ahead okay um, so I'll answer the first question uh, first. So um, we, from the beginning of our um, existence, where we started in Argentina, we always had a 501c3 nonprofit status here in the US. Um, so we were incorporated and then filed for the 501c3 status here. Um, since, to be able to take donations and, and fund the office that way. Um, since then, the Argentina office actually, um, is under its own legal entity. They're a foundation under Argentina law. Um, also Nicaragua is registered as a nonprofit under, under their country's law. Um, and then since this is kind of our, our newest office in the US, um, we had wanted to get the CDFI um, for the past few years and we, we just, uh, just got it last month. <laughs> so, um, but that's just using our US loan data. Thank you. <laughs> um, but that, again, that doesn't, so when we were applying for our CDFI status, we excluded all of our international um, operations and loans and just focused on the US, US side. Um, and then uh, your second question. Um, I, I wasn't involved when we applied for our 501c3, since that was about 15 years ago or so. Um, but I don't know that the IRS, I mean, it, I don't think they know what a cooperative is. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I think they look at a mission of um, uh, financing, financing, um, below market financing, uh, below market or free technical assistance to help start small businesses and in low income communities. And that's kind of more their their speak, um, their language, and the things that they look for. Um, I think I'm curious to hear if anyone else had had any other thoughts on that. Um, so we are actually not incorporated as a 501c3 tax mm -hmm. exempt not for profit. We are actually a, a for profit cooperative. Um, mm -hmm. There's a it's primarily kind of a political strategic motivation for that. And we actually, we suffer from it a little bit because it's harder for us to get grant funding. Um, but it was, we, we wanted to truly be owned and controlled by the cooperatives. And if you're not for profit, you're controlled by the co-ops or controlled by your leadership, but you're not technically owned by it. It also allows us to pay 
uh, dividends in a more direct way to our investors uh, than a not-for-profit 501c3 would allow us to do. So there's a couple of different reasons, other reasons beyond that even, that we chose this structure. Um, but we, uh, so we're, we're not tax exempt, not for profit. We do have a fiscal sponsor. And so we do occasionally receive some foundation support and donation support and can pass that through our fiscal sponsor in order to, to access those things. But it does mean that for the most part, it's harder for us to get grant money. So we have to earn our keep off of all of our, our interest and fees that we earn from our loans. Um, we're about 70% self-sufficient. And so as an 11, $12 million fund, um, that's a, a difficult but not impossible place for us to be. Um, the reason we're not 100% self-sufficient is because we do a lot of stuff that just doesn't pay for itself. A, a lot of that handholding and technical assistance and stuff just doesn't pay for itself. So, so that's, that's where we're at. The CDFI designation in particular, uh, there are for-profit and non-for-profit CDFIs. Most of them are not-for-profit. Uh, but there are a variety of different kind of CDFIs. Really the motivation for doing that are at least twofold. One is it gives you access to potential government funding uh, for your loan pool and for uh, fiscal assistance. It also gives you, it also makes it easier for banks to invest in you and claim their Community Reinvestment Act uh, points that they wanna get for being an investor for their social impact. Um, and on the social impact side of stuff too, you know, as, as was referenced earlier, you know, at the end of the day, we see that, you know, any truly democratic uh, business that we're supporting is, is an improvement in the social strata of our country. But we also, uh, a, a significant, uh, the great majority of our work does go to lower income communities and minority owned businesses and such. And so that's uh, something that does make it easier from time to time to get some mission based money into our fund. That's great. Um, the stack is open if there are any other questions. Um, I'm going to slide one in right now, just following up on that. Um, what you were saying about investors, I, I know that the focus of this webinar is about borrowers, um, but there is also a role within the sort of, within the chain, the food chain of, um, of ultimately lending money, which, which is around investment. And I know that because you're all tapped into cooperative ecosystems, I'm curious, um, what, what the role is for co-ops who may be interested in taking some of their surpluses or reserves and, and actually investing within the cooperative ecosystem. How does that work for those of you who do that? If you're interested in that, what is that like? Um, yeah, what advice do you have for people who might be interested in investing in your particular um, organizations? Sure, someone on the start. Um. I just un unmuted myself, is that okay? <laughs> we have, I have two things to offer about the investment side. I mentioned quickly in my introduction that we are primarily investor driven, um, which gives us a certain stability with our funds and very much invested in by um, other nonprofits, by service organizations, by religious fellowships, by other cooperatives, the cooperative investment essentially gives them an opportunity support to support other cooperatives, but also gives them an, an income. Uh, we are able to pay interest and our, our sort of break even is that we pay a bit less interest than the uh, interest rate we charge on our loans, essentially. Um, the other side is that we are also able to be a fiscal sponsor for our cooperatives if they have people who want to donate to them but want their donations to be tax deductible. So that's a service we can provide if, if a co-op is raising money uh, to supplement or to lower the amount they need to borrow or to fund a special program. Um, I think that covers what you asked, right? Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, well, for us, you know, it is an interesting experience being on both sides of that equation with co-ops. And so, of, and, you know, on the borrower side, of course, people want the lowest interest rate, the lowest fees they can find. 
on the investor side, they want the highest interest rate they can find and they want absolute security and return on all their investments. So there's a weird conversation that has to happen in the middle of that. Um, and which is sometimes exciting and sometimes frustrating. Um, because in many ways on the investment side, we are competing with Wall Street and Wells Fargo and JP Morgan Chase and places where people can put their money and earn some return. And also on the lending side, sometimes, not necessarily in the worker co-op world, but in with larger, more established co-ops, people are shopping around for the lowest interest rate they can find on their loan. Part of our conversation is usually around helping people understand that maybe they're earning a point less on their investment or paying a point more on their loan, but that point on either side is investing in the co-op economy. Whereas going for the cheapest loan you can find, the reason that loan is cheaper at J.P. Morgan Chase is because someone is being exploited somewhere to earn those profits and keep that money cheap. So that's, there's a big education piece in there that we do on an informal basis, and we've actually developed a few more workshops on that. Uh, but I think as an industry, there's a broader conversation us, for us to continue to have in why people choose different places to both find their money and, and put their money. Absolutely. Can I just add to that for a second? Of course. Um, I guess in a way, um, what Mark is, is pointing to is that investors in CDFIs are mission-driven investors. They want to invest in something they believe in. And from the practical financial side, he's absolutely right. You invest in Wall Street, not only is it volatile, and you can lose everything. Um, but also you are essentially supporting a vast network of exploitation that you can barely even ever find out about. And um, yeah, there was another quick piece and I have completely lost it. Oh, got it. In 2000, let's see, 2011, I first applied for this job. And I was invited by CFNE to go to the Opportunity Finance Network Conference in Boston, which is um, the, the C CDFI umbrella organization. And they had the meeting at the Federal Reserve. And the reason they had it there is because the Federal Reserve had discovered during this economic crisis that we had that CDFIs were the most reliable return on investment in the whole country. I mean, we may not be able to guarantee our investments, but we have, we have, um, what, we have not lost an investor penny in 42 years, and we have lost a total of, I think, one loan in all that time. So, I mean, that's pretty spectacular, and it's pretty safe, even if we don't have a big piece of paper that says, we promise. So I can just answer briefly on this one, because um, I think Mark and Deborah both done a good job. Um, but at the, so at the working world, uh, most of our uh, fund, our loan fund money right now comes from social impact investors. Um, like Deborah mentioned, that, that those are the investors in, in the CDFI world um, and foundations. Um, so with, you know, we don't, because we've just received our CDFI status, we don't have any of that CRA money coming in yet from the mainstream banks, but could in the future. So that mix might look a little bit different um, going forward. Um, and we don't currently have uh, cooperatives um, investing in our loan fund here. We have done that in Argentina and in Nicaragua. Um, so it's something we definitely be interested in looking into and, and figuring out how that could work uh, here. It's just a step that we that we haven't taken yet. Okay, so um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Josh chatted a question over here, um, and I think it's targeted at Mark. So get ready. Josh wants to know, what's the deal for individual investors in the co-op? Is there a return target for investors? And what have the dividends investors been historically? I think you started covering some of that, but if you wanted to add anything. Uh, 
Mark. Oh, did you look at us? It looks, sorry, it looks like my connection is a little slow here. Am I back? You're back. Okay. Um, a quick answer. So for individual investors, um, we've got a range that people are like you sign and you sign an investment note it's there for a fixed period of time you know it could be zero to three or four percent depending on the conditions and the size and, and whatnot um so you know it's it varies i guess is the is the short answer there and if you wanted to talk about more specific details i'd, I'd hand you over to christine our executive director who has sort of the official uh designation as our investor persons follow up with you individually on that okay okay so we are gonna um i guess begin to wrap there going back to slides over here um and related to some of some of what you were just starting to tease out uh mark and, and a few others of you um about the impact financially um of the traditional economy and the traditional field of lending. We'll go to the next slide. Um, there's an opportunity to explore all of this at the Eastern, the upcoming Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy, where their theme is resist and transform. I know that there's a host of workshops. Some of you are leading some of them. Um, and I'm saying that as both panelists and participants. I know many of you are leading many workshops. So that is coming up in just a couple of weeks on June 9th at Fordham in New York City. Um, our own annual meeting will happen then as well. We have both an election section of that and a strategy, a strategy session. We'll, we'll be able to get in the weeds on different issues related to immigrants and racial and economic justice and all of these different things. Um, additionally, we do have, <laughs> um, this feels funny, I'm just like talking about our coffee roast. But um, we do have a new partnership with Thread Coffee, which is a worker co-op um, based in Baltimore, which is uh, called Ring of Fire Roast. And you can buy that online through them. We'll also be selling it in person um, in New York at the Eastern Conference, uh, both wholesale and by the cup. And um, so I wanna make an announcement about that. The, the partnership that we have actually goes toward, we get something like a dollar per bag of coffee that we sell that actually goes right into supporting the work we're doing with immigrant communities um, during the current economic times and, and especially organizing a lot of our members who happen to be immigrants. And um, I also wanted to make a lot the last couple announcements that this fall, we're gonna be entering our open enrollment period um, both for our dental plan, which is existing, but also a new vision plan that we're rolling out. So we'll be doing enrollment this fall and, and um, launching the vision plan in January. It will similarly be very good quality and uh, very affordable, just like our dental plan. Um, and we do have some other benefits as part of that uh, rolling out as well. Uh, discounts to pet insurance, discounts to movie tickets, like $8 movie tickets, all kinds of other things. So we'll be talking about that later. Um, additionally, you should be in touch with us uh, on the staff for our 2017 Roadshow. We're gonna be visiting more members the, later this, um, this spring and then in, in the summer and into the fall. Did have a chance to visit some members earlier this spring over in the Midwest, which was wonderful. And, um, and also to just mark start thinking about um, our upcoming marketing webinar. So it's about marketing for your, your co-op, your business, your whatever you need to market. <laughs> so stay tuned for more information about that. And um, lastly, nope, we've got a penultimate slide. What have we got? Oh yes, this is, well, this is just a general reminder about member benefits. We did our last webinar uh, or two webinars ago was really unpacking the, some of the different access to, to benefits, discounts and services, including some of the training that we started talking about and technical assistance on this webinar. So you can check that out on our website. Um, and we also have new, some new fangled handouts that explain and, and unpack that. And very, very last slide is just to thank you for joining us today. Um, so thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all of the lenders out there, the organizers out there. Um, and thanks for, for sticking around. And of course, investors too. So thanks. Great. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.